Hello, welcome to Michelle's House again. I'm Michelle. So it's finally here. I've been teasing you about it for several weeks now, but today is September 1st, 2022, and it is the launch of my So Purple to End ALZ 22 challenge. My goal for this challenge that we'll be running for the entire month of September is to help bring awareness um, to Alzheimer's and dementia and hopefully to raise a little bit of money. So um, let me just get into it. I have a lot of notes written, so I will be referring to my notebook quite often. The reason that I chose September is because it is World Alzheimer's Month. And that's so that's across the world. All nations celebrate, not celebrate, recognize September as World Alzheimer's and Dementia Month. Um, I'm going to read you a few facts, then I'll tell you a little bit about my personal story, and then I'm going to share the details of the challenge with you. So, as I mentioned, September is World Alzheimer's Month. It is the nation's largest underfunded health threat in the United States. Currently, there are about 50 million people internationally that suffer from either Alzheimer's or dementia. Like I said, Alzheimer's is a form of dementia. It is the most common form of dementia. And unfortunately, it is fatal. Um, currently, there is no way to prevent, cure, or slow the progression of the disease in the United States. And it is currently the sixth largest cause of deaths in the United States. Dementia is a degenerative brain condition. It robs a person of their memory, their competency, their comprehension, and it comes with some pretty significant behavioral changes, which that I think for me was the biggest surprise um, when dealing with my dad. And I'll get more into that in a minute. There are over 100 forms of dementia. As I've already mentioned, Alzheimer's is the most common. It's, it's about 50 to 60% of the dementia cases. I am going to, um, put up a infographic right here that gives you some highlighted facts about Alzheimer's and dementia. Some of them I believe will be eye-opening to people. Um, I'm also going to add a link in the description box if you are interested in learning more factual information, how to recognize early warning signs, um, you know, and how to find a support group if you're a caregiver or even a person that is dealing with dementia or Alzheimer's, because up until a point where um, you don't necessarily understand what's going on and you're still kind of in that area where you understand what's going on but and you're struggling with it then there are support groups for that as well so let me tell you a little bit about my dad so my dad his name was bruce which was a nickname his first name was broussard which was my grandmother's maiden name and it's a very common name in um south southwest louisiana the heart of cajun country um <clears throat> and he was born in 1944. His father owned a shipyard. His grandfather owned a shipyard. And so my dad grew up in the shipyard business. When he graduated high school, he ended up, uh, he and my mother got married like right after high school so that my mom could go with my dad when he went away to college. And he went to Mississippi State. He earned a degree in engineering. He ended up working in the oil industry for his entire career. He actually worked for the same company his entire career. And when he finally retired, he took early retirement at 49. He had never taken a sick day in 30 plus years. And he had, well, I guess not 30 plus, 25 plus years. And um, he had so much unused vacation that he and they paid him out for all of his unused vacation. He was able to pay off his house and his car and everything when he retired. Um, he was just the epitome of high work ethic, high integrity. He was an amazing human being. Um, 
he loved woodworking. So while my mom was very artistic and crafty, my dad did woodworking. So I got the creative element from both, but my dad's creativity came in the form of perfect lines and angles, <laughs> which fit his personality, right? Um, he worked on our family history starting back in the 70s, um, way before the um, introduction of the internet. And he did it the old fashioned way. He went to libraries, he went to churches, he um, did correspondence with other genealogists, and he built his family tree on both his mother's and his father's side, all the way back to the 1600s, still here in the United States. Um, so uh, his first um, ancestor on his father's side came over to Boston from England in the um, early 1630s and his um, most further his furthest back ancestor on his mother's side came to Louisiana from Nova Scotia he was an they were exiled Cajuns um, or Acadians at the time so he did all of that work um, pre-internet and I think once the internet came into play he was able to fill in some blank spots but he had gotten that far back before the internet so um, and he did not put a name on our family tree unless he had it documented so every name that I have and I inherited all of his genealogy research after he passed away any name that is on that tree is confirmed and is legit um, okay um, one of my favorite stories about my dad is from later in my life. So my current husband and I were, it's a second marriage for both of us. Um, we dated for, you know, a couple of years. And then when we decided to get married, both of our leases were up and we're like, you know what, let's just, let's move in together. So he wasn't comfortable with us living together without being married because he had two teenage daughters. So we got engaged in May and planned our wedding super fast and we were married by June. <laughs> um, in fact, my husband did all the planning. I was just too busy with work. Um, and we had a very, very small intimate wedding. I think we had 11 people there. And because it was so like so little time in between when we got engaged and when we got married, I just assumed my family wasn't going to be able to attend because there wasn't enough time for them to plan anything travel wise um, because my family all lived in the South in Louisiana and Mississippi. So a couple of days before the wedding, my dad called me to tell me that he was coming. He's he said, my daughter is not getting married without me being there. <laughs> and so he just, he surprised me. And I cherish that memory. Um, he, it was funny because he packed so fast that his jacket and his pants didn't coordinate. I couldn't care less. He was worried about it. He didn't, he is, he was always uh, embarrassed about it from the pictures, but I didn't care. I was just so grateful that he made it there and that he made it a priority to come and be there with me on such a special day. He did not want any of us, his, my siblings and I, he, he didn't want gifts from us for any of the typical gift giving holidays, birthday, Father's Day, Christmas. He didn't want gifts from us because he basically bought whatever he wanted or needed, he bought. And my dad was very philanthropic and he didn't boast about it. He didn't talk about it all the time, but he was constantly supporting charities, whether that was through his personal time or his finances, he supported them and he didn't talk about it. It was just one of the things that he did. So in place of gifts, one year he sent us a story about, and I wish I still had the story, but he sent us a story about a dad asking for um, his children to be philanthropic in his name in place of giving him gifts. And so I picked up on it and I, so from that point forward, unless it was something that I handmade, so I did, used to do cross stitch and I made him a father's tree. I'll insert a picture here. It's one of my most favorite things I've ever made. Um, but other than stuff like that, anytime there was a gift giving holiday, I donated to a charity in his name. He lost his baby sister to ALS many years ago. So for many years I donated to ALS. Um, 
when he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, I started donating to Alzheimer's and his wife was di um, diagnosed with Parkinson's pretty close to about the same time he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And so I used to donate to all three of those um, very near and dear to our hearts um, charities in place of giving him gifts for all of those occasions. And that was just the kind of a man that he was. And um, so I wanted to share that before I got into um, the disease. So when he first started being worried about his memory loss, we kind of all laughed it off and just chalked it up to, you know, it's normal age related memory loss. And we thought that my stepmother was exaggerating some of the stories because when we were with him, we would go for short visits and he seemed fine to us with the exception of, oh, I forgot where I put my glasses or why did I come into this room? Well, heck, I do that, you know? So I didn't think anything of it. Well, it kept getting more and more progressive. And finally, um, his neurologist officially diagnosed him. And I could tell, like, every time I was with him, I could tell he felt very strongly that it was more than age related memory loss. And so the fact that he was, you could tell he was scared about it. I mean, my dad was an engineer. He used his brain his whole life, very intelligent man. So the thought of losing that, I can see that being a scary thing. And when I, I think when it finally hit me that it was real and I should take it seriously is when he asked my siblings and I to all go and visit him at his house. My dad lived in the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. I was in Philadelphia. My older brother was in Chicago. My younger brother and sister were still in Louisiana. He asked all of us to come and meet him at his house for a long weekend. And his intention for that weekend was to show us where all of his important paperwork was, where his will was, who was his power of attorney if he got sick who was um, the, I forget what he called it, but the executor of his health wishes, if he wasn't able to make those decisions anymore, where his long-term care insurance paperwork was. Like he, my dad was very <laughs> planful, very organized. He had everything labeled and in specific places and he wanted to make sure that we knew where all that was in case it got to a point or when it got to a point that he wasn't able to tell us that. So that's when it hit me that it was real. And so I think after that visit, I put more and more emphasis on the quality of the visits when I was there. Um, I think the, I always thought that the hardest part for me was gonna be when he didn't remember who I was. And although that was hard when I realized that that was the situation, that was less painful to me than watching him be scared and confused and not understanding what was going on. And that's just heartbreaking. Um, the behavior changes that come with Alzheimer's are extreme. My dad was never an angry man. He never raised his, if he raised his voice, which was so few and far between, I think I can count it on one hand. It was because he was, we had done something that scared him that he, you know, so for example, when I was in middle school, we lived in Texas, I was in middle school. And for some reason I decided to walk home. I was six. <laughs> And there was a really busy road on our way home. How I knew where to go, I don't know, but I got a spanking when I got home. And as an adult, I realized it's because I scared the bejesus out of him. That is the only time my dad has ever spanked me in my life. Um, even when I had a hit and run, when I was 15, I had just gotten my license, which yes, in Louisiana in the 80s, when you were 15, you could get your license. I think it's different today, but yeah, um, I had a car, I did a hit and run, not like crazy, it was a busy street, I hit somebody's bumper, I told him to follow me, he didn't follow me, 
And so he hired a private detective to come and anyway, my dad didn't even yell at me then. Like he's not a yeller, he's not an angry person. So once he started like getting really angry and yelling and, um, you know, I think it was because he was scared. He didn't understand what was going on. And he thought people thought he was stupid. And that was the thing. He would say, I'm not stupid. I know that. And I, I mean, he hadn't yelled at me my whole life. So initially it hurt my feelings. Um, but of course, immediately I would be like, well, it's the disease. Like I didn't take it personally. It still made me cry because I hurt for him. That was the hardest part for me was seeing how scared and angry he would get. Um, there, uh, it's again, not just memory loss. There are a lot of physical changes, um, in, in terms of, um, control over your body, um, just confusion in general. My dad was always a, a stickler with his finances. He was very good with his money. He invested and he, you know, he had a percentage that he invested on riskier adventures and a percentage that he invested on sure things. Um, he had, he was always a proponent of big time savings. And so when he started letting his financial advisor do a little bit, have a little bit more control over his finances, that, that was also another clue to me that things were progressing further along than I had earlier realized. So unfortunately we got to a point where because of my stepmother's Parkinson's, she was falling and hurting herself constantly, but she still had her full mental capacity. And my father, he still had his physical strength, but he didn't have his mental capacity any longer. So they were a good match in terms of physical and mental, but because of the lack of physical and the lack of mental, they were also, they needed help. And it got to a point where my stepmother could no longer physically take care of my father. And it was at that point that we ended up having to put him in a memory care facility, which was extremely heartbreaking. I think if we had all lived closer, things might've been different, I don't know. The first memory care facility that we put him in was supposed to be the best one in his town. They did not take good care of him. He was there for close to a year and we saw signs of it. In the beginning, we thought it was great. And then we saw signs of him not being cared for to our standards. And that's when we made the decision to move him. We found a brand new memory care facility that only had 12 rooms. So it was a much higher ratio of caregivers to patients. And he did really well there. Unfortunately, he was only there about not even a year. We moved him there in February of 2020 and he passed away in October of 2020. I have a hard time talking about my dad's experience just because A, he was a private person. So he, if he was still alive, he wouldn't want this shared with the world. Um, but also just because it was a very difficult time. It was a difficult thing to watch. It was really difficult because the bulk of the care fell to my little brother because my dad the memory care facility that we put him in was in the town that my little brother and sister live in. And my brother just ended up being the primary contact. And a lot of pressure was put on him because, because of my dad's anger issues, that was the issue at the first facility. They ended up not taking good care of him because they didn't like dealing with his outbursts, which is from everything I've read, a typical symptom of Alzheimer's and dementia. So the fact that they had a hard time dealing with it and they were supposed to be the premier memory care facility in the city, those two didn't connect for me. So um, we did find a place that dealt with him much better. He liked them much better. And even though he didn't remember anybody, I think he had a sense of who took, who took good care of him and who didn't. And so 
I would just recommend that you do, if you do feel the need to put your loved one in a memory care facility that you do research just because something claims to be premier and they charge a lot of money and they've got a nice facility, doesn't mean that the care is there. So that would be my advice. Um, anyway, so that's my story. Um, my dad did pass away from Alzheimer's. It, like I said before, it is fatal. Um, his care, he was on a lot of medication that didn't seem to slow the progression. It didn't make the symptoms all that much better. So I encourage you, if you're able to, to make a donation. I will put a link in the description box. I have a tribute page for the Alzheimer's organization, a tribute page to my father that you can donate to, or if you prefer to donate to your local chapter or wherever you live, whether it's out of the country or somewhere else, um, I encourage you to do that. I don't care who gets credit for the donation, where it comes from, who it goes to, as long as we continue to fund this, the research for either a cure or at least reducing the symptoms or making the symptoms more livable, if that makes sense. So I'll put that link in the description box. And um, what else can you do to help with Alzheimer's research? There, the alzheimers.org, alz.org website has links to events across the country. They have cycling events, they have walking events, and they encourage you to um, create your own fundraising event, kind of like what I'm doing here. Um, I am encouraging people to wear purple, to make something purple um, in, in support of Alzheimer's awareness and to help raise money for to fund research. Um, you can um, donate directly, as I mentioned, to the link below. Um, if you have a YouTube channel and you are not part of my collaborations because I could only fit in one a day. <laughs> um, I would be honored if you would choose to make something purple and have a video um, talking about it. And I make sure and let me know and I'll share it in my um, community tab and I'll talk about it on my channel. And I'll post about it on Instagram. I would love to bring awareness to your channel and in, um, exchange for you bringing awareness to Alzheimer's. That would mean the world to me. Um, so on to the challenge. So the challenge is going to run from September 1st to September 30th. I would like for you to make something in purple, whether it is a solid purple or a purple print, but I would like for it to be predominantly purple in the theme of the Alzheimer's purple awareness color. Um, you can sew something. It doesn't have to be a garment. It can be an accessory. It can be home decor. It can be something for your pet. I don't know. People sew a lot of things. Um, somebody recently asked me if you could do knitting or crocheting. Absolutely. Knitting, crocheting, that works as well. Um, post a photo of your make on Instagram. Um, I do, unfortunately, that's the only to make it easier for me to keep track, that's going to have to be the entry, the the point of entry. So post a picture of it on Instagram, whether you're wearing it, the recipient's wearing it, or it's just a flat lay on a table or your floor, that's okay too. Um, use the hashtag so purple to end ALZ 22 Make sure you use the 22 because that will distinguish it from last year's entries. If you think about it, then you could also use the hashtag World Alzheimer's Month. And finally, and don't forget to tag me at The Real Michelle Sews Again. That way I will see your post. So those are the rules for entry. I am going to be um, collaborating with many amazing YouTubers on my channel over the course of the month. I have a collaboration every single day of the month. I have one day of a break. <laughs> so it's gonna be a really busy month. Um, I am, instead of, I've talked to you already about who all the collaborators are, and I've talked to you already about what all the projects are, but here I'm gonna put some info um, charts that show you um, 
which collaborator is on which day and what project we're doing. And I will put all of that in the description box every single day this month. So you can always see who I'm collaborating with for the day. Um, I have a wonderful group of prizes. Um, Adam from Adam Sews has made a gorgeous purple themed um, bag, one of his amazing little bags. Um, I have posted a picture of it on Instagram, but here's another picture of it. Um, all of the um, prizes will be randomly chosen by a name generator from the internet. Um, I will not have the bandwidth to do, plus judging just doesn't, it's, that's too difficult for me. How do I pick something? How do I pick the winners from so many amazing entries? I, I can't do it. So it's gonna be a random name generator. So we've got the bag from Adam. We've got a PDF pattern. If you follow Stephanie Farrell Focus, and then you know that she has recently designed a hoodie dress. I don't believe she's released it yet, but um, she is donating, she is kindly donating one of her PDF patterns for the hoodie dress. I have a voucher from Itch to Stitch. I have three PDF vouchers from Stylart. I have two $25 vouchers from Rebecca Page um, patterns. I have a um, $10 coupon, I'm not sure how many yet, from PDF Plotting. That one's probably gonna be US only. I believe the rest of them are international. Um, just shipping wise, um, they're, you know, it's just a $10 coupon. I can make it international, but I think the shipping would be prohibitive. Um, and I have a voucher from Friday Pattern Company and a voucher from Helen's Closet. Um, I will also be ice dyeing some fabric and donating that, or that will be a prize. Um, it'll be two yards of fabric that will be um, ice dyed in shades of purple. So those are the prizes. If prizes incent you, then hopefully those sound exciting to you. If prizes are just a nice extra and you would participate anyway, then that is great too. Um, as I did last year, I will be donating $1 for every entry, every distinct entry. So if you post multiple photos of the same entry, it's one, it's still only going to count as one. And I'll be donating $1 for every distinct entry on Instagram. And last year I got 80 entries. So I rounded up and donated $100. So on the um, tribute page for my father, you'll see it's already over like 500 and something dollars. I had a lot of um, donations, plus I did the $100 for the matching of the entries. Um, I would love it. So I think that's pretty much it for the challenge. It's pretty simple. I would love it if you would go and check out all the other channels that are listed in the description box. Um, please come back tomorrow for my very first collaboration. My first collab is with Angie from Fun Endeavors Tie-Dye. She is the person that I have watched religiously since I started getting into ice dyeing. Um, and most of what I've learned, I've learned from her. And so I was super excited when she agreed to um, partner with me on this collaboration. So that will be my very first collab and that will be posting tomorrow. So that's it. Please let me know what your thoughts are on this. Let me know if you're planning on participating um, and wherever you are, I hope the weather's amazing. I hope you're able to get some sewing in and I will talk to you next time. Bye. Bye.